I'm a physicist, and um, actually I found this doing this lecture over the years um, quite a challenge actually to get the balance of of simplicity and complexity, and um, bearing in mind there's cardiologists who have not really done much CT before, and radiologists who know all about everything, it seems, and ask me very difficult questions. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm going to take you just through, hopefully, a middle ground, which will just um, provide some, some uh, educational challenges and perhaps reinforce some of the basic knowledge as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about multi-slice CT, about a little bit about the scanners, about image reconstruction, and about image display um, with the images that you'll be looking at. Then how to specifically scan the heart with multi-slice CT, and a few tips or comments on how the manufacturers have improved the temporal resolution, the volume coverage, and the spatial resolution. Well, computed means determined by mathematical methods. Tomos means section, and graphia means to write or to draw. And I like unpacking sentences, so I quite like this one. Uh, Godfrey Hounsfield is the inventor of clinical CT, uh, and that was in 1971, they scanned their first patient. And in 1979, he was awarded, together with Cormac, the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology. And in his Nobel speech, which you can find on the website, uh, on the internet, um, it says a further promising field may be the detection of the coronary arteries. It may be possible to detect these under special conditions of scanning. And that was the picture in his speech in 1979. And that is just absolutely quite amazing and very visionary of the man who invented practical CT scanning. And that's why you are all here today with much better images, but I think you must agree it's quite incredible. There are three main um, applications or categories for applications of cardiac CT, and they have different ways of scanning. There's calcium scoring, the, the Agatston score. There's coronary CT angiography, and there's functional imaging. And there are certain differences in the modes of data acquisition and reconstruction. Before I go any further, I'll just deal with this one, the electron beam CT scanner that was produced in the 1990s. Um, there were many in the States, there are a couple in this country. That specifically was designed for doing the calcium scoring, uh, it used three, three millimeter slices. It was very poor resolution, but it had magnificent scan time, 30 to 50 milliseconds, because basically the whole gantry was a, um, a big X-ray tube, and these are the electron beams whizzing around an anode. But what about multi-slice CT today? Well, the modern, uh, modern multi-slice scanners started in 1998, late 1990s, moving on to the 16 slice, 64 slice, and now the 320 detector row scanner from Toshiba. What does it look like on the inside? This actually is, is a very old scanner. Um, but you've got an X-ray tube, an array of detectors, a gantry aperture, and the patient sits in the middle and an X-ray fan beam as well, and about a 1,000 detectors. Now, each detector element measures the intensity of the X-ray beam attenuated by the patient through a path back to the focal spot of the X-ray tube. So essentially, each detector element is measuring the attenuation. <coughs> Traditionally, we think of CT scanner having a fan beam, and very often with the single-slice scanners, that's how we, we, we regard it. Um, and as you go to more and more detector arrays, we tend to call it a, an X-ray cone beam. There's no strict transition of whether you call it a, a fan beam or a cone beam, but you can see it becomes much more three-dimensional. And with modern scanners, we're looking at a typical detector length of about 40 millimeters, uh, but anything between 20 and 160 millimeters. Okay, so I've just taken out a little detector element here, and this is the detector array from the Equilion 64, 64 by 0.5 millimeter slices. And generally, for, depending on the scanner, we have um, up to 320 rows of data, and the minimum size of the detector element is about 0.5 or 0.6 millimeters. 
This is just to put it in context, context with the body, and you can see that only one of the scanners is going to cover the heart completely. And this presents a challenge for cardiac imaging. Here we have the G light speed 64, 64 by 0.625 millimeter detector rows, acquiring, acquiring 64 uh, slices of data simultaneously. Now the thing to point out here that the detector elements are 0.63 millimeters, but we can acquire um, uh, wider sets of data slices where the signal from the neighboring detector elements can be added together, giving thicker slices. So we can not only acquire 64 thin slices, but 32 1.25 millimeter slices, or 16 by 2.5 millimeter slices. And that has an important implication for spatial resolution, which we'll come back to. But um, in case I run out of time at the end, it's always best to acquire uh, thin sli data slices um, and then reconstruct your images later. The typical fastest speeds um, of the scanners, uh, and these are the fastest speeds, they'll do slow rotation speeds as well, but we're under half a second, depending on the manufacturer. And I think you agree, it's quite impressive. You want to be in the middle of that, I think, so you're safest being the patient there. I think you agree also that if you're acquiring masses of data, and in fact if you acquire about 1,000 data um, uh, attenuation profiles per, per rotation, that that's uh, extreme um, detector speeds, um, electronics, and very high computer power. Okay, so there are two basic forms of scanning. There's axial scanning, which is called um, alternatively step and shoot, or sequential scanning. The tube and the detectors rotate around the patient, the couch moves forward, um, and uh, a set of axial slices are created. The same thing happens again, the couch moves forward, and so forth. So that's, um, the Americans call it step and shoot, which I think is quite, um, uh, well, it, it describes it, doesn't it? But then there's helical scanning. There's a continuous gantry rotation and a continuous table feed. The scan data traces a helical path or spiral around the patient, and the multi-slice helical data is used to form axial images by a means of interpolation of the data. Right. Now, in helical scanning, what you need to know is pitch, the definition of pitch. This is the table travel per rotation divided by the X-ray beam width. There is now a standardized def definition. If you were working with multi-slice helical scanners some years ago, you might have come across various different definitions. Um, uh, but typically now, your pitches will be up to a value about of two. So if you come to a value of about 12 or something, it's using an old definition. So in this example, a pitch of two, the table travel per rotation is 80 millimeters, the beam width is 40. And you can see quite easily how you can um, acquire, your, you can work out it's an extended spiral, it's a pitch of two. So generally that's used with single slice scanners, maybe a pitch of 1.5 or up to two. Pitch of one is generally the value that's used for multi-slice and, uh, and around about one. But in cardiac, we're looking at typically 0.3, where we've got an overlapping pitch, and we need this because we need to have overlapping sets of data. Okay, so we, I, I said you had about 1,000 detector elements in each arc, and what we have here is what we call our attenuation profile. It's measuring the attenuation at each ray back through the, to the anode. And we also have about 1,000 angular projections so we have a lot of data. And in axial scanning, this is in the same plane. But what happens in helical scanning? Well, as I said, it's, a, it's an interpolation. Just to simplify this, at position A, if we have um, our attenuation profile here, addition, uh, position B, it's a different part of the body, so it's a different uh, attenuation profile, there's a different um, characteristic, maybe the, the hips are in the way there. 
but we want to know what the attenuation profile would be if we shot the X-ray beam down there and measured the um, ar array, the at attenuation profile there. And just by a simple means of linear interpolation or the probably more complicated methods of interpolation, in fact there are, um, but we can estimate what the attenuation profile is. And because it's a calculation, we have a tremendous flexibility of our reconstructed position for our image. And therefore, we can reconstruct at any position we like, uh, interpolating between A and B. Now, that's very greatly simplified, but that's probably all that we need to know for here. OK. So we've got all our attenuation profiles. How do we reconstruct the image? I will just say at this point, uh, I'm generally fo following through the slides in the handbook, but there are some extra ones and some change positions and things. So how is the image reconstructed? Well, first of all, think of it as a black box. You've got your attenuation profiles from every direction. But if you look inside the box from a number of different directions, you can find out what's in the inside. It's very simple. Same if you took a shadowgram of this, this woman here. One direction you can see a pineapple, in the dire other direction you can see a banana. <coughs> but you need both directions to work out what's there. Now in CT, and I'll just very quickly go through this because it puts it in context with um, newer methods of reconstruction. The simplest approach is back projection. We reverse the process of obtaining the attenuation profiles to reconstruct an image. And each projection is distributed evenly at the appropriate angle back across the reconstructed image. And by doing this for all angles, the image is reconstructed. So we take our attenuation profiles, map them back into the image, and we can see that we've found our object. We do this for a number of projections. We finally end up with a representation of our image. Now, that simple back projection, you can see it's very fuzzy on the bottom right-hand corner. And um, we have to sharpen up that um, projection data. It's modified or filtered before reconstruction, and then we do the rest of the process as before. And that's called filtered back projection. Now, you don't really need to know much about this, but you have the tools to, adopt, to adapt this, this filter on the scanner. They're called different things on different manufacturers. Here we've got a sharp or a smooth. They're called... AH30 on Siemens, AH something else, um, and Toshiba have their own ones as well. So what we've done here is by applying these filters, sharpened up the attenuation profile. Then when it's mapped back into the image, we find that we've got a very clear cut representation of the object and compare it with the blurred picture there. Right. So there are analytical techniques. That's the filter back projection. There's techniques to overcome cone beam artifacts. And we won't talk about that here. And also cone beam reconstruction. And then there's the new iterative reconstruction. And on many of the scanners, these are the commercial names, ACIA, MBIR, IRIS, Sapphire, etc. So this is just a rep representation. We've got the filter back projection at the top here showing you that picture as before. CT image is taken, and then it's forward projected. So it's, si it's simulating a scan, if you like, of that image. And then there's a calculation, so that's the calculation of the projection data. It's compared, corrected, and then reconstructed again. And that process goes on around a number of loops. That's all I'm going to say on that. So very quickly. You'll be wondering when I get to cardiac. This is all providing the building box for cardiac. The CT image and the image display. The pixel value, uh, the, or the pixels, have a value called the CT number. And that represents the average attenuation of the three-dimensional volume element. That's the voxel. The depth of the voxel is determined by the slice width. And the... Um, pixel size, the dimensions of it in the two dimensions, is the field of view divided by the matrix, by the number of pixels. So for example, if you have a 250 millimeter field of view, you've reconstructed your heart on, divide that by 512, and each pixel represents 0.5 millimeters. 
and the value assigned to that pixel is a CT number. And that represents the linear attenuation coefficient values of the pixel relative to that of water. Um, and this is the equation. You can get rid of the bottom uh, one there because the attenuation coefficient of air is actually zero. So by definition, we've got water as zero, air as minus 1,000, and bone as plus 1,000. Okay, I'm not going to go into all of this, but I think it's really important to remember that the linear attenuation coefficient is the mass attenuation coefficient times the density. And therefore, your CT number depends on the density and all these things as well. The atomic energy, uh, this atomic number, sorry, the energy and the electron density. And that has uh, consequences, particularly when you're looking at, say, iodine contrast and its dependence on energy. These are some of the CT numbers. If you put a pixel over here, you'll find that the system is telling you what the pixel value is. That's the Hounsfield number. Most soft tissue is just in the tens um, up to about 100. <coughs> Bone is up to a, a, or over 1,000, and fat is less dense than water, so it's a negative number, and air is down there at minus 1,000. And because lung is generally a mixture of air and tissue, you're looking at about minus 750. The CT images are displayed using uh, either 256 or 128 gray levels. Now, if you mapped all those CT number values, um, and there's more than 2,000, if you map them over the 256 gray levels, you're not actually going to see very much in your image. The contrast is going to be very poor. So we need to select a range. <coughs> And by doing that, we define, and this is for the cardiologists among you, <laughs> we, um, we need to define a window level and a window width. So we define where we're going to base our gray level, of, our gray scale of black to white. So here we'll place it in the middle. And our window width is how wide that's going to be. These are our CT numbers. Okay, so we've got minus 1,000 here, which is air, and very, very dense bone, just really to the top of the um, numerical scale. And we can move the window level up and down, and we can also widen the window. And that helps us to visualize the contrast better, or certainly between soft tissue or tissues that are close in CT number, and it helps us to really take greatest advantage of the digital image. This is just one example. And we've got, uh, here we've got the window level down at minus 600. The window width is about 500, and it's about 400, which sets broadly equivalent. So here we're down in the lung region. We can see lots of lung detail. And on the right-hand side, we can see a lot more soft tissue detail, because the level is up around zero. And this is just a, a, a visualization of what would happen if you had a very broad, wide window. And as I said, you'd lose your contrast. OK. So there's also a volume set of data that's generated from this. And you'll be seeing a lot of these during your course here. Um, and the images can re be reconstructed in any direction by a variety of techniques. There's multiplanar formatting that looks at the data in different planes. And that's perhaps more what you're familiar with. Um, so you can get any cross-sectional view that you particularly want. And, um, and then there's things called surface shading, volume rendering, and then maximum or minimum intensity projections. The maximum intensity projection is the brightness of a pixel given by the maximum CT number along a path through that volume set of data. So it's as so though you're going along that path and you're picking out the maximum CT number, you're mapping it on there, and uh, so on and so forth. And that gives you much better contrast. And then there's a converse, the minimum uh, intensity projection that picks up the minimum value uh, through the path. Right, well, that's quite a lot on the basics of CT, but I hope it provides a very good undergirding for scanning the heart with multi-slice CT. So we've got an acquisition and reconstruction that is linked to the ECG. The patient is wired up, 
And in order to freeze the cardiac motion, we need to image during the phase of least motion. So that's diastole or end systole. It's just a schematic view of cardiac motion here. Just to familiarize you with the terminology, we've got an R to R interval that's defined as 100%. The reconstructed image position is usually given as a percentage of that R to R interval, for example, 70% from the R peak. Sometimes it's given in terms of milliseconds before the subsequent R peak. And then the extent of the data that is used to um, reconstruct the image is um, given as a percentage again. So this width is 20% of that total width. And ideally, the width should be at least 10% of the R to R interval, and ideally, yes, uh, less. It's uh, what sort of a rule of thumb that comes from the papers. So if you've got 60 beats per minute, um, that's one, as a standard heart rate, that's one beat per second. So your R to R interval is one second. 10% of that is 100 milliseconds. So that's the sort of scanning time that you're looking for as a rule of thumb. Obviously, there's a wide variety around that. Now, the scanner minimum rotation times are 300 to 500 milliseconds. So we're not doing very well if we want to take a picture um, with only a, a shutter speed of 100 milliseconds. OK, so what we need to remember is that opposing projections provide the same information. So to reconstruct images, therefore, only 180 degrees of the scan data is required. And so we can get rid of the second half of the scan data. And we can now say that our imaging time is the rotation time divided by 2. So instead of 300 milliseconds, we can now say we can do our cardiac scan in 150 milliseconds. Uh, just to point out for completeness, there are two definitions of the percentage phase position where this, this reconstruction data is situated compared to the initial peak. It could be 60% um, position, and that's marked by the start of the data that's used. or um, So that's that, the beginning of the phase window. Or it could be to the middle. And so depending on your scanner, and, um, uh, it was for some time, I'm not sure if that's still the case, that Siemens did this definition and the others did this definition. So uh, you might just want to be aware of what your scanner is determining when it says it's going to reconstruct at 70%. Is it the beginning or the middle of the phase window? So at diastole, we're talking at about 70% um, of that R to R interval. And just, this is just an illustration. If you looked at 50 or 60 or 80, here we've got some movement artifact. It's just an illustration, but it perhaps helps visualize that. However, for higher heart rates, um, uh, and again, I just do rule the thumbs. I don't do the clinical stuff. But <laughs> um, for higher heart rates, you're generally looking at the 30 to 40% phase position, and also for the right coronary artery. Now, why do you suddenly jump to the 30 to 40 percent? Well, this is because this particular region doesn't contract as quickly when you go from 60 beats per minute to a higher heart rate, whereas this contracts very quickly. So it's often determined to be a better position to reconstruct that. Now, what this is saying is that there is a need for some flexibility of reconstruction phase position. So, you need to be able to determine when you've done your scan, oh, am I going to reconstruct at 70% or am I going to reconstruct at 60 or 50 or 30 or 40? There's, there's some uncertainty, so you need to have some data to play with before you reconstruct your final image. So, there are two main approaches to cardiac scanning. The original cardiac CT scanning started off with helical scanning, and that was because of the limitations in the technology. Now, a, a, a lot of scanning is done with axial scanning because it's um, generally perceived to be lower dose. But to be honest, I think they are often uh, converging through the different techniques. And hopefully, I'll take you through that fairly quickly. 
The axial scanning is often called prospective triggering. And I would say that's like a snapshot of, if you imagine you've got some hurdlers going through a race and you want to take a picture of their legs, and actually their legs are stationary when they're jumping over the hurdle. So you'll take a photograph. And that to me is prospective triggering. You're waiting there, you, you snap it as soon as they've gone over. You might do four or five rapid shots, and that would be prospective triggering with padding that I'll come to, but you're basically fixed on that point of, of least motion. Helical scanning is like having a, um, a moving, oh, sorry, my little movie doesn't work, is having a movie where um, you're, you're videoing the whole, the whole race, and then you're going back and selecting out the images that you want. So you've got the film of the whole race, and unfortunately CT, that's, that's the dose. Uh, you've got the, the film of the whole race, and you're just going back and selecting. So with prospective triggering, axial scanning, the R wave is recognized because you've hooked your patient up to the ECG. The scan is triggered. You move the table, and because of the timing of everything, you miss a heartbeat, and then you do the next data collection, and so forth, till you've covered the scanner, uh, till they covered the heart. And uh, here I showed the radiation on for half a rotation, and we we'll use all that data to require our image slices. What we want to do, though, is a, a give us a little bit of flexibility, so we're not necessarily reconstructing at 70%, but maybe 65 or 75. So what we do is have the x-rays on for more than half a rotation, and then we have the flexibility to choose the data um, in order to reconstruct our image, and we can move it so we've got the first 180 degrees or the last 180 degrees. It just gives a little bit of extra flexibility, a little bit of extra dose, but a little bit of flexibility. So now let's move to helical scanning. We have an overlapping pitch, a pitch of about 0 0.2, 0 0.3. This gives us lots of data to play with. And we need to because we're wanting to select out the phase at 70%. So we scan the whole lot, we film the whole show, and then we go back and select out the data that we want at the 70% in this example. And this just shows that this represents the imaging for here, this is a bit further along the heart, and so forth. And it's just a sequence of cross-sectional views through the heart. So we call that helical scanning with retrospective gating of data. So it's a full helical scan, and the data is collected at all phases. But there's wasted data and dose for cardiac angiography. If we just look at one position here, the advantage is that we've got lots of flexibility to select data for the best phase. We can select it just either side, or we can actually select the whole lot, and we can reconstruct them to create a functional study now, if you consider each of those colored bars actually rep represents an image, so we could be essentially scanning the heart at all its different phases, put it together, and make a, a little video. This is just a whole selection of cross-sectional ones. This is in your notes. So all this is wasted if, all, if that's all you want to look at at the 70% value. Actually, you might want a little bit either side for the flexibility, but you've got to consider, are you going to use that other data? That's just another cine loop. Okay. So with helical <coughs> scanning, when we've gone back and retrospectively gated out the data, selected out the data, we've, um, we've got a situation, as shown here, which without EC2 tube current modulation, which will, uh, obviously I'm leading you into the next slide, so we've got the tube current is maximum throughout the scan. We've selected our phases of interest, and the rest of the data is potentially redundant. So what all the manufacturers use is ECG tube current modulation. And the tube current is decreased outside of the region of interest. So this is our phase of interest. We've got a little bit of, of uh, the equivalent of padding in axial scanning, so we've got a bit of leeway. And we either go down to 20% or some scanners will go down to 4. 
Um, and some even go down to zero, but I sort of put that into a slightly separate cat category. Okay, so that's just what I've described, that we've got a bit of flexibility for the imagery construction. We can still use this data, and if we wanted to do a functional study, we could use this data. That, that is the advantage of keeping a, a little bit of tube current in this area. It means it will be fairly poor image quality because I'm sure you all know that if you decrease the tube current, your noise increases, but it might be good enough for what you want to do. So we call that helical scanning, retrospective gating with ECG modulation. And I have to say all the terms get a bit labored because in many ways they're merging into one as I see it. And as I said, the tube current can also be decreased to zero on some scanners, and I think the Toshiba is, is one of those. And in a way, you'd then regard that as helical scanning with prospective triggering and a little bit of retrospective gating if you want to select out the data. <laughs> but I probably, you might want to forget that if you're already a little bit confused. So we've had axial scanning, helical scanning. Uh, we, we call it prospective triggering, triggering with padding. The helical is retrospective gating with ECG modulation. And then the prospective triggering where the modulated dose goes down to zero. OK. I'm just going to throw this in, because um, I said there are three. I, this slide isn't in your, um, in, your, in your notes, and it might. I'm very happy to have a debate with anybody about it. This is how I classify it. The calcium scoring is generally prospective axial. And it's three millimeter slices to relate back to the standard that it's, it's scoring against. For coronary CT angiography, you're generally doing prospective axial, particularly on the modern scanners, or retrospective helical, certainly on the early scanners. Uh, and on the early scanners, you had no ECG modulation, and they were very high dose. That's where you, when you read papers that say you've got 30 millisieverts, that's, that's what they've been doing. Generally, they'll be doing with ECG modulation now. And then function functional imaging, um, you're doing retrospective helical, and you're looking at all the phases. Right, so in the last uh, five, ten minutes or so, I'm going to look at how you improve the, um, the temporal resolution, the speed of volume coverage, and the spatial resolution. So temporal resolution, it depends on what you're, you're imaging, and it depends on your shutter speed. It depends on your subject and your camera, if you like. So at the top, we've got our patient at 60 beats per minute. As I said, we're, as a rule of thumb, we're going to look for 100 milliseconds. With our typical scanners, we've got our shortest rotation times there, less than half a second. Um, and you can see that even then, even at 0.27 rotation time, our half rotation time is 135 milliseconds. And really, that's, that's barely near what we're wanting to image. And certainly, if you had a high heart rate, it's way over the 50 milliseconds that you're sort of in your head trying to aim for, or theoretically trying to aim for. Now, with the patient, of course, you can slow down the heart rate with beta blockers. Um, or you can shorten your imaging time. And there's three ways you can do that. You can get the manufacturers to develop scanners with faster rotations. But I think all of them are close to their limit at the moment. They haven't sort of shifted too much in the last couple of um, years. And you saw from that video that it's a tremendous engineering feat to rotate at the speeds that they do. Or you can do multi-sector reconstruction, and that tends to be with helical scanning. Or you can do some development like Siemens do with two tubes and do simultaneous two-sector scanning. Well, I'm just going to look very quickly at multi-sector reconstruction. So uh, it's used in helical scanning, as I said, although Toshiba, you can do it because you're imaging the heart all in one go, and so it's possible but with the others it's not. Um, and what happens is that the sectors of data are taken from different rotations to create the image. And there are advantages and disadvantages of this. And it makes use of the overlapping pitch because you've got a lot of extra data you can play with. So this is what we've been looking at so far. It's single sector, half a rotation. 
and each image will use data from one heartbeat. And that was 150 milliseconds. Now, if we consider um, we, we're overlapping in the same place in the heart, so we're going to take half of our sec a half of our or our first sector of, of half a rotation from the first heartbeat. And then we're hovering over the same period in the heart and we take the second sector from the second part. So this is 75 milliseconds. So we're already utilizing a much uh, smaller part of the heart movement. But we have got the problem of stitching them together and that's where some of the artifacts do arise. But in total, we've got 150 milliseconds worth of data. And this can be done for three sector and four sector, so theoretically going down to 19 milliseconds we can, um, temporal resolution. But you have to factor that with that you need consistent heartbeat for four heartbeats. And this is just a very brief illustration this is a two-sector one and a three-sector one, which shows much better image quality. But if you search in the literature, you could find something that's showing it was poor image quality. So it, it needs very careful use. Uh, so I've already said the first point. It requires a steady heart rate for good registration of sections. And its advantage is it's only for specific heart rates, and it's an, an incredibly complex relationship between the heart rate rotation time, pitch, and uh, the effect on the temporal resolution. So and it tends to go up and down, and it's very complex. And most of the manufacturers don't let you play with it. They just sort it out automatically. Um, they all have a number of different options. I think GE give you a little bit more flexibility in choosing. Um, but um, that's in your notes. You just look at that for reference. Siemens acquire two sectors of data simultaneously. They have two tubes. I'm sure you all know about the Siemens definition, dual source, definition flash. And in quarter of rotation, it's simultaneously acquiring its uh, required data for reconstruction. So there's no problem with what happens in successive heartbeats. And so we, for example, the definition flash, we can have a 75 millimeter, millisecond scan. So obviously an advantage with underneath our goal of 100 milliseconds. Well, volume coverage, really that, that's uh, sort of hardly needs saying anything about in one sense, but I'm just going to make a few comments. We need to stitch together data. Typically for a 64 slice scanner, we've got 40 millimeter beam width. And uh, uh, so we, we would need to scan the heart in different sections, and this is just an example of typical detector lengths for the different number of slice scanners. A regular heart rate enables us to have easily matched data. An irregular heart rate increases the potential for misregistration. It sort of makes common sense, really. And this applies both the axial and helical. And this is a real scan. You can see the mismatch of the arteries there. Now, earlier cardiac scanning um, used the four slice scanners. Really, the problem was the breath hold, because you're looking at four one millimeter slices, and it would have taken 48 seconds to cover the whole of the heart. And so with the wider beams and the faster scanners, uh, we can now scan the heart in um, six seconds or six beats for a 64 by 0.5 millimeter slice scanner. And that uh, is tremendously advantageous because you've got much more stability of the heart rate. Uh, and we've got the same advantage in an axial scanning. The wider beams and more and thinner slices just enables the axial cardiac CTA to be made possible. And if you wanted to work out the number of heartbeats, you've got to remember that you miss, miss one heart, heartbeat because of moving the couch. So with a 40 millimeter beam, you'd probably be able to scan the heart in about seven heartbeats with an 80 millimeter beam in three and in the Toshiba scanner just in one. 
And this is the Philips Brilliance ICT with an 80 millimeter coverage. It's a Toshiba. Okay. So covering the heart in a single beat has been the holy grail of scanning. Toshiba have done it with Equilin 1 and Siemens have done it with, with their Siemens Flash. So they operate in a slightly different mode on this. So now the two tubes are treated as separate acquisitions and there's a single trigger and um, we've got two separate spirals, a single um, exposure of the heart and we have all our slices here, each at 75 milliseconds because we're pulling out the data separately. We've, we've scanned a fairly long region over the heart there, so you generally have to operate at a um, uh, less than 65 beats per minute to be able to achieve that. So we have improved temporal resolution with fast scan speeds, multi-sector reconstruction and dual tube faster volume coverage with larger detector arrays and high pitch scanning such as the flash. So my final few points on spatial resolution. Um, I always include this because Taryn particularly had asked me right at the beginning. <laughs> um, we have, um, ideally we're going to reconstruct with isotropic spatial resolution less than one millimeter. So it's equal resolution in all planes. So we have thin, slice, thin slices, uh, but also our scan plane resolution has got to match. Now there's lots of ways that the manufacturers will achieve this, both in the scan plane and the z-axis, focal spot, detector sizes, number of samples, and then the reconstruction algorithm and reconstruction techniques. Now if you remember right at the beginning, I said that you can acquire 64.63 uh, millimeter slices, or you can acquire adding those, those data signals together. Now, it's always advisable to acquire thin and reconstruct thick, because if you acquire at 0.63 millimeters, you can, you can reconstruct both thicknesses of slice. But if you acquire it thinner, you've lost your ability to reconstruct your thin slices. It's a lot of data and you've got data handling issues, but that generally is a rule of thumb. And we saw how to calculate the pixel value, pixel size, if you scan a, a 350 millimeter field of view, your pixel size is going to be 0.7 millimeters, so it's going to be quite big. So it's always important to reconstruct down to 250, but there's probably no point always going much smaller than that because you're probably beyond the spatial resolution of the system. We're just doing a sort of optical zoom. Uh, smoother filters have lower noise and lower spatial resolution. That's smooth images on the left and sharp on the right. Cardiac CT generally in many uh, cases actually uses a smoother algorithm and that's when you'll get blurring when you're trying to image very high contrast objects such as calcium or stents. And in those instances it's often better to use a higher spatial resolution filter um, and also uh, um, match the, dis the small field of view as well. Um, and in those instances then you can get rid of this blooming artifact. So that's uh, quite a sort of whistle-stop tour through multi-slice CT, scanning the heart and some of the techniques that are used to improve temporal resolution, volume coverage and spatial resolution. If you wanted to see some of these fundamental basics that haven't changed since we wrote this report quite a few years ago now, but I think it's still quite a good educational tool, you can find that on, on the website.